This morning, I, uh, I'm really excited. I get to talk to you guys about a subject that is not talked about very often. Um, it's actually a passage of the Bible that's, that's extremely short, but it's, it's probably one of the most puzzling passages in our Bible. It's, it's kind of confusing, so I want to just take a minute, and, and we're going to introduce this idea of, and then, kablamo. Now, I don't know if you know what the word kablamo means, but as a child, it was one of my favorite words. Whenever I would tell a story that had an awesome ending, I would say, and then, kablamo, it happened. So I could be telling a story about, um, about how I got to school one day and, and discovered it w- we had a substitute teacher, and kablamo, she pulled out the DVDs, and we got to watch movies all day long. Or I could be telling a story about, about being out with my family, and then kablamo, I find $20 in the parking lot. How awesome is that? This idea of kablamo is this the idea that everything changes in an instant. You don't, it's not a progressive change, but it's a, it's a moment, it's one way, and then the next moment, it's another way. Kablamo, everything changes. In our lives, we've, we've all experienced these kablamo moments. For some of you, it may be the time that, that you dared your dad to race you, and you realized as you finished the race, you beat him for the first time. Kablamo. He's no longer the strongest man in the house. For others, it may be the first time you got in a car completely by yourself and drove yourself to the grocery store or drove yourself to church or drove yourself to school. You knew from that moment on, life will never be the same. Now I have freedom. Now I can do whatever I want. For others, especially for the parents in the room, it's the very first time that you hold your child. You look in their eyes and you realize, my life has changed. I lived one way and I thought I was preparing for nine months to bring me to this moment, but everything has changed now. Kablamo. It's all different. The, the, the point that I want you to understand this morning is that these kablamo moments, we can't be prepared for them. They come at us out of nowhere and when they hit us, it's, it's like hitting a brick wall or like being hit by a truck. It just, it changes everything. And we can't be prepared for it. This morning we're going to look at 2 Kings chapter 13. First we're going to look at 2 Kings 13, 20, verse A. It says this, Elisha died and was buried. I know you're sitting there, you're like, well, that's it? That's this big, mind-blowing text that we're going to be discussing this morning? Elisha died and was buried. What I want you to understand is that Elisha at this time, Elisha was the prophet of God. So when Elisha dies, the people have to realize the prophet is dead. It's a life-changing moment when the prophet of God is no longer with you. You see, in the, in the Old Testament, it was, it was kind of one of those things where, yeah, they had some scriptures and they would read them at, at uh, the synagogue, at the temple. They would have these kind of things, but... Really, in your daily life, the one who would speak and would change things was the prophet. The prophet was the mouthpiece of God. He was the one that would tell you God prefers this or doesn't prefer this, or God is calling you out of this sin and into this holiness. The the prophet was probably one of the most important people in Israel at that time. In fact, I would say that the prophet is more important than the king in Israel. You see, kings came and went, they died and they lived, and Israel kept going. But when a prophet would die, it was like the Bible just kind of stops for a minute. It's like there, there's a stop sign there as we read the Bible. Whenever Elisha dies or Elijah dies or Moses dies, we have to stop for a second. We say, wow, that closes a chapter in the Bible. It closes a, a, a moment in time. For the people, their connection to God got a little bit more distant the day that the prophet died. I imagine that that the day that Elisha died was a day of mourning in Israel. It was a day when parents had to pull their children to the side and say, Elisha has died. The man of God is no longer with us. It was a kablamo moment. In that moment, everything changed. No longer can you go to Elisha and say, Elisha, I I have this field I want to buy. What does the Lord think of this? And Elisha would respond. 
No longer can you go to Elisha and say, Elisha, I heard you preach a sermon three weeks ago, and and I, I think it applies to me, but can you explain it a little bit further? The prophet is dead. The biggest part here is that Elisha, in his ministry, was known for his wise words, but more importantly, he was known for his miracles, for God's miracles in his ministry. Elisha was known for changing the lives of people that he interacted with. So when Elisha dies, we're instantly brought to a moment where we have to question if the prophet is dead, if, if the man of God has left us, does that mean the miracles have left us? Does that mean the power of God has been rescinded back to heaven and now we're left to live our lives by ourselves? People found a moment where they, they were alone. Some of us know how that feels. You're in a room full of people and yet you're alone. Because something happened. That kablamo moment happened where everything changed. And it doesn't matter if there's a hundred people in the room or there's a thousand people in the room. All you know is an intense loneliness inside of your heart. That, that feeling of intense loneliness. There's no one else who knows my pain. There's no one else who can come alongside me and walk with me through this because, well, it's my pain. When our world crashes down around us, it seems as though God himself has vanished from the face of the earth. When everything seems to go wrong in that kablamo moment and everything just, just, just tur- takes a turn and it's like, my life will never be the same because of that one moment. Where is God? Where's God in that moment? Why do we feel alone in the world when we need companionship the most? Shouldn't the church be providing that companionship? Why do friends and family seem so untrustworthy at the times when we need them the most? Why is the prophet dead? You see, the the story of the Bible, what we have to understand is in the story of the Bible, God's people have always known loneliness. I know it's a, it's a hard thought to think about that. We've, we've always known loneliness. It doesn't mean we've been alone, but we've always known loneliness. There's always a feeling inside of God's people's heart. Well, not, not always, but there's, there's always moments of feeling inside of God's people's hearts that they're alone, that God has left them, that they question, why am I doing what I'm doing? God abandoned me here. Perhaps you're in this room this morning and, and you're in that situation. You say, you know what, Pastor Philip, I'm sitting in this room. I feel completely alone. There's a hundred people around me, but none of them know what I'm going through. None of them know my pain. What I would say to you this morning is, the prophet is dead. We find ourselves in a hard situation. We've had kablamo come down on top of us. Instead of a kablamo moment bringing us out and, and making us happy and bringing us joy, kablamo has crushed us with death, with sin, with the grave. There are times in my life where I question God and I say, God, why does there have to be sickness in our world? God, why does there have to be death in our world? God, why does there have to be sadness in our world? And the, the answer always comes back because we as humans are sinful. We introduce sin into our world. We disobeyed God. So where is God in the midst of our trials? I realize I've, I've kind of brought the sermon down. Let me bring it back up. Where is God in the midst of our trials? Let's look at the rest of, of 2 Kings 13, verse 20. We're going to read the second half. And we're going to read verse 21. It says this. Now, Moabite raiders used to enter the country every spring. Once, while some Israelites were burying a man, suddenly they saw a band of raiders. So they threw the man's body into Elisha's tomb. When the body touched Elisha's bones, the man came to life and stood up on his feet. Hold on a second. Let me read that one more time. When the body touched Elisha's bones, okay, so the guy is dead. When the body touched Elisha's bones, The man came back to life and stood up on his feet. 
I don't know if you realize what that passage just said. This guy was dead. D-E-D, dead. And I know that's the wrong spelling. Don't correct me afterwards. It's a joke. D-E-D, dead. Dead as a doornail. His family had prepared the funeral. They had him probably mummified, all wrapped in the, in the cloth. And they're on their way to his funeral. They're getting ready to have this, this sovereign occasion, this solemn occasion. And they throw him into a grave in a hurry because they have to go protect their fields. And the guy comes back to life. Kablamo. The guy is back to life. I want you to imagine what on earth is going through this guy's mind. All he knows is, wow, I was sick and then I died. The very next thing I know, I wake up all wrapped up in a bunch of gauze and I'm laying next to a dead man called Elisha. Can you imagine the story he must have told when he, when he finally got out of the grave and he told his friends and family, hey, I'm back to life. What's up, y'all? Can you imagine how he, how he told the story of, I was dead and I have no idea what happened. Kablamo, I was back to life. What I want you to understand this morning is, is our main point. God is active. When the prophet is dead, when everything has pushed us down, when everything has crushed us, when we feel that intense loneliness inside of us, God is active. God has never once abandoned you on your journey through life. Though it may feel as though he's removed his hand from you, though it may feel as though he's left the face of the earth, God is active. And when we stop having faith that God can intervene on our lives is when we start worrying about ourselves and we start becoming more and more depressed and we start to look at ourselves and say, oh, woe is me, I can never conquer this world. The truth of the matter is we were never called to conquer the world, Christ was. You and I were never called to change the world, Christ was. So when we start depending on ourselves, we say, I had a kablammo moment, it went bad. When we start looking at ourselves and we say, oh, woe is me, we forget the fact that God is active. God is moving. The story, if you were to read 2 Kings chapter 13, there's, a, there's a, actually a part leading up to this. Jehoash, who's the king at the time, speaks to Elisha, and Elisha is very sick and he's about to die. He comes to Elisha and he says, we're about to be invaded, what are we to do? And Elisha gives him a word from the Lord. Basically, you're going you're gonna to defeat these people. You're going to be defended. And then Elisha dies. The prophet is dead. Surely in that moment, King Jehoash must have questioned, is God dead? Has God left us? It was the man of God who told us we were going to conquer the army. What if the army comes and God has removed himself from the situation? What Jehoash learned in that moment when the man who was dead came back to life is that God is active. God is active when we ask him to be active and God is active when we're not expecting him to be active. On that day, no one asked for that man to be brought back to life. They were just trying to get the funeral with in a hurry so that they could get to the fighting that had to be done. As they threw his body into the tomb, they didn't say, Oh God, we pray that you would bring him back to life. Ashes, ashes, dust to dust, and walk away and go fight their battle. They, they left him there almost as, okay, just hold on. We'll come back later and we'll do the funeral stuff, all that. But God is active. No one asked God to bring that man back to life, but God did. Why? Because God is active. Because, because God is moving in our lives. Because even when we are so worried about our own concerns, when we are so worried about what is impending down on us, what's pushing us down, God is still the deliverer. God is still looking at your life and saying, I have a plan for you. God is still looking at your life and saying, I'm not done with you. God is still looking at your life and saying, you got more years to give, you have more passion to give, you have more people to touch. Don't get down on yourself. God is active. The other night I found myself, I, I was at the gym. I found myself in a steam room completely by myself. No one else was in there. I had my headphones in. I was listening to some worship music. I'd been there probably about, I only stay in there about 10 minutes. That's about all I can handle. And after about five minutes, a song came on that I really liked. And I, oh, I'll, I'll sit in here a while longer. 20 minutes later, I'm still sitting in that steam room. And I, I finally kind of, not come to because I wasn't knocked out, but I finally realized I take my earbuds out 
and I've been sitting in there by myself just singing a worship song. If someone had come to that door, they would have thought I was the looniest guy on earth. What is wrong with this dude? It's hot in there. He's sweating all over the place. And here he is singing praises to God. What is wrong with you? But God is active. I wasn't looking for God to intervene and talk to me on that Thursday night at 10 o'clock at night. I was just trying to listen to some good music and get through my steam time so I could stretch my muscles back out. But God is active. In our lives, we, as adults, as we, as we grow older, we tend to forget the fact that God wants to work on our behalf. If you were to uh, ask a kid, in fact, when, when we were in Crete Kids, and I asked the kids, what do you guys want to pray for? You would be amazed at the things that they list. Everything from a skin knee to my dog is sick to my grandma is dying. All, all, the gambit is wide. But they have faith that God is going to do something. You see, we as adults, we who have been in the church a long time, we tend to think, yeah, God is able to do those things, but he doesn't do that anymore. God doesn't perform miracles anymore. God doesn't just heal people. He gave us doctors to give us good medicine, and, all, and that's great. Doctors are awesome. I don't want anyone to hear what I'm saying wrongly and think that I'm saying don't go to the doctor. Please, if you're sick, go to the doctor. Um, but God is active. If you ask a kid, can God change the world they'll say yes if you ask an adult they'll say yes but in their heart they're saying there's no way the world is too dark the world is too harsh the world is too far from god but but this morning let me remind you god is active this morning we're going to take some time and we're going to pray um, if you were to look at your watch um we're finishing early, and that's intentional. We're going to take some time, and we're going to pray. Musicians, if you'll come up. What I want you to understand this, mo this morning is that the kablammo moment doesn't have to be a bad thing. The kablammo moment is when you can point to August, what are we, August 17th. You can point to August 17th at FC3, and you can say, on that morning, God changed my life. My outlook went from dark to light the pain that I've been carrying around for years is gone the sickness that the doctor said I was going to have for the rest of my life was healed this morning we we're going to pray awesome prayers of faith but what I want you to understand is this in order to have a kablamo moment God wants you to trust him God wants you to trust him enough to ask for restoration. Is he active when we don't ask? Yes. But this morning, we're going to ask. We're going to ask God to change our lives so that then we can go out and change the world. There are some in this room that have prayed or they have family members that have prayed for healing and God didn't heal them. And we look at that and we say, well, God obviously neglected that situation. This morning, what I want you to understand is God is active. And sometimes the best solution does not line up with what we want. But we submit ourselves to him and we say, God, you be God in the situation and I'll be his follower. I'll be a servant.